I want to welcome you all <clears throat> to uh, good, our Good Friday Colloquium here. Uh, the, uh, today's colloquium is sponsored by the Office of Research and Training of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel uh, uh, School of Social Work. Uh, today marks our fourth colloquium of this year, to which we have invited some of the most renowned social work researchers uh, in this country. We're especially honored today uh, to have Dr. Trina Shanks from the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan. Dr. Shanks, by all accounts, is one of the true rising stars in our field. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Joseph, the Leona Beavis and Marguerite Hannon Associate Professor in Community Development, who will introduce Dr. Shanks. Thanks, Jerry. That's Gerald Mahoney, for those who don't know, Associate Dean for Research here at the Mandel School. Good afternoon. It's great to see so many of you out here on a Friday, on a holiday uh, weekend. So thank you for coming out. I guarantee you, you will be glad that you're here. Uh, truly a pleasure to introduce my friend and my colleague. And thank you to Dr. Shanks for also being here on a long weekend. Um, and we're excited she's here. So as you've seen in her bio, Trina Shanks is the associate professor at the School of Social Work. She's also a faculty associate at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. And she's also the associate director of the Curtis Research and Training Center. Dr. Shanks has had a very interesting personal journey starting out in New Orleans, which I did, I'm not sure if I knew that, but learned that again today. But spending time in Indiana, grew up mostly and went through school in Indiana, some time in DC, Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador. I think I also learned that for the first time. No, I knew that, I knew that, because you've been back. Uh, a time as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University in England. Uh, and then a good bit of time in St. Louis, where she did her undergraduate degree, and then her PhD uh, and MSW at Wash U. And then Michigan has uh, been graced with her presence, uh, re really her entire career as an academic at the University of Michigan. I think what I admire, there's many, many things I admire about Trina, but one of the things I really admire is just the versatility of levels at which she works. We talk a lot about micro-macro, I think I would call you macro micro um, because she identifies as a macro person, uh, but her expertise, her focus is around children, around youth. And so she just blends these levels and has work, as you'll hear, at the child level, youth level, family level, neighborhood level, community level, and city level. So it really has work that spans across, which um, is impressive and extremely valuable in our field to have someone like, like Trina. She's, as I've just learned, at a really interesting moment in her career, and doesn't happen much in an academic career, where she's coming to the end of an extremely long study. And this is her signature effort. This will be her and her colleagues legacy effort, one of their legacy efforts, uh, the SEED program, which is around child savings accounts. And to what extent, and I won't steal any more thunder, but to what extent those can be an incentive uh, for different kinds of behavior and aspirations and action. So they've been tracking these kids uh, since they were pre-K. And what's happening now is they're getting out of school. And so the first are going to begin to graduate from high school and then the next set. And then the study will close out with some follow up from there. So it's been a long journey. And it'll be interesting to hear more from Dr. Shanks about how she's thinking about next steps from here. So one last thing. I love the mix in the room. I thought it'd be helpful for you to get a sense of who's here. If we could just get, by show of hands, I see a lot of community members, so members of broader Cleveland community. If you could just raise your hands who are here today. Great. Thank you all for coming out. And then we've got students who are here. If you're a student in the room. Wonderful. Uh, there's some undergrads, Dr. Milligan is saying. Oh, she wants a particular undergrad to wave. <laughs> Welcome. And then we've got some faculty members in the room. If you're on the faculty, if you could raise your hand. Uh, wonderful. And then we've got staff I also see in the room. If you're a staff member at Case. So it's just a really, really nice mix. So thank you all for being here. Without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Trina Shanks. Wow, after that introduction, maybe I should do my speech. But thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to spend a little bit of time today talking about economic inequality and its implications for youth. And I hadn't thought about being the macro micro link, but um, hopefully this will help you see how I think about how a lot of these things happen, both at the structural level and then going down to the family. 
So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the grand challenge that I help lead, um, reducing extreme economic inequality, and then a theoretical framework a colleague and I came up with for thinking about economic security and child outcomes, and then, as Mark mentioned, the potential of child savings accounts, which is um, an intervention that I've been working with for quite a long period of time. So for those of you who may not be familiar, um, there is the grand challenge in social work, and one of the 12 is reducing extreme economic inequality. And so I co-lead this grand challenge with Laura Lane, who's also at the University of Michigan, Jennifer Romick, who's at the University of Washington, and then myself. If you're really interested, there's a website you can go to see all of our white papers and policy briefs and some of the ideas we have going forward. But I think it's one of the most important challenges in the US right now because the top 1% owns wealth and income, and that puts disadvantage to those at the bottom who are struggling to even survive day to day. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about this grand challenge and go on to my other work. So if you weren't aware, in the United States, there were periods um, after the 60s going into the 70s where income inequality was decreasing. Um, but over the last decade and a half or so, it's been getting worse. And this is the top hundredth of a percent of the, of the US population and income. And you can see that now that top percent in 2012, 2013 has as much of the total income as was before the Great Recession, I mean the Great Depression. Um, so it got better for a while and it's getting worse. Um, if you look at what that means, the top tenth of a percent has over six million dollars in uh, average income. The bottom 90 percent, that's 90 percent, so the very, very bottom, has on average 34,000. So you can see almost all of the economic gains in our economy is going to the very, very top. And if you want to see this even more precisely um, in the more recent periods, the bottom fifth and the middle fifth has been pretty stagnant. And then the top has been doubling and tripling over the last few decades. And if you want to see it in earnings, the same thing. The bottom has gotten worse. Um, the middle has maintained, but the top has been increasing, even in earnings. This is weekly wages. And so if you look at wealth instead of income, it's even worse. So you think inequality is bad in income, it's even worse in wealth. So that little dot would be what 40% own because the bottom part of the um, income distribution are more at zero and negative net worth. Um, and then the top 1% would own a huge part and, and the rest you can see how that goes. So wealth inequality is even worse than income inequality. And if you look at this same thing, top 10th of 1% since 1913 to 2012, you can see we haven't had this level of inequality since the Great Depression around 1929 going in the 1930s. Um, so again, it declined for a while, but it's been going up quite steadily over the last few decades. And so you look at what that means. The bottom quintile, bottom 20% has negative net worth, so that means they owe more than they have that's worth anything. Um, and then the top fifth um, is much, much higher. Um, and they've been increasing after the recession as opposed to decreasing like most groups have. And then if you look at what type of assets are held, the interesting thing, there's a lot of equity at the bottom 90% with debt, right? So they have almost representative of their percent of the population in debt. But if you look at things like stocks and bonds, pension accounts, and even home ownership, um, the top 1% and top 9% have much more proportion of those um, assets than others in the country do. And if you've been following it, there's also a racial wealth gap. And what's interesting about this, some people would have thought after the civil rights movement in the 1960s, things would be getting better. But if you look at the data for what we have for wealth from 1983 to now, it actually has gotten worse. I mean, it's, it, um, the racial wealth gap reduced a little bit after our recent recession. Um, because stock, stock market crash, a lot of things happened, but over the last five years, it's been increasing again. And so this is kind of, this isn't just the amount of wealth, but this is the amount of wealth on average held by whites, and then comparison to blacks and Latinos. And you can see that it's getting worse, and um, there's a huge gap. And so this is some work um, that I have done looking at children. Um, and the sort of households they live in. So these are children who were born in 2001, who are going to be the children who are graduating from high school now. Um, and so if you look at the portfolios of their families, um, for black, Latino, and American Indian um, households, the majority of them are below 1.85 of the federal poverty line and have little or no assets. And so this wasn't um, a data set that's an early childhood longitudinal study. So this isn't a data set that did careful calculation of net worth, but they asked, do you have a home? Do you have money in the bank? Do you have stocks and bonds? Do you have retirement accounts? And when you look at that, um, 
the red, the dark red of those had none, none of those things. Um, and if you look in comparison to white, half of them were the most advantaged. They were over 1.85 of the poverty line, and they had multiple of those assets that were asked about. And so the, the, this paper that I wrote, we're talking about how you're in completely different landscapes. The world you grow up in, the opportunities you have, are very different if you're a household that has decent amounts of income and multiple um, amounts of wealth. And you can see that there's huge disparities in this country by race um, for children as well. And so I'm not going to go into detail with this here because I was told it was supposed to be a short talk. Um, but our grand challenge do, does have policy suggestions. Um, the, the first several around income and employment, and the very last one was about wealth. Um, so if you're thinking about income reform, we need labor um, market reform so that people don't have, you know, they come into work and then no one comes to the restaurant so they're told to go home and they don't make anything. Crazy hours that are, are erratic and unpredictable. Um, so you want just regular standards in the employment sector. Um, Obviously, some help around business startup and capitalization. If you can expand the earned income tax credit so it's not just for people with children, but also other single um, households, um, and then and raise the bar, that can also be something, because it's the one thing in our country where we have been putting at least direct cash in the hands of low-income families, and then have better access to child care. So those are things we talk about. If you're really interested, you can look at the policy brief. But I'm going to spend time today talking a little bit about wealth building. And one of our suggestions is to create new lifelong policies for inclusive and progressive wealth building. Because as you've seen, not only um, are the disparities in wealth bigger, but the implications, as you'll see, are, are, are greater too. So we're going to spend some time talking about that. Actually, though, before we go there, I'm going to talk a little bit about my theoretical model around child outcomes and how economic security influences child outcomes. And I always start with this question. Of course, you know the answer because you know what I do. But what better predicts long-term outcomes for children? A developmentally appropriate assessment of their ability as a young child, so let's say at three years old, or their economic and social advantage? Um, and the answer is their economic and social advantage. Um, but this is some work that was done by um, Arnold Samaroff, who comes from the University of Michigan. And they actually took IQ tests at four years of age. And they followed these young people all through high school. And so what you'll notice, let's see if this little pointer works. OK, these squares are those that are low risk and um, low IQ. This triangle is low risk and high IQ. At the top, you have high IQ and um, low risk. I mean, yeah, yeah, low risk and high IQ and high IQ and high risk and high IQ and low risk. And what you'll notice is that by the time you get down here, even the young people who had high IQ at four are doing worse than the people who had low IQ at four if they are from a more advantaged social status than they were. And the way they measured um, social economic advantage, they used income, um, they used employment, they used a few, um, the mental health of the mother. So there's several things they looked at, but those low risk people who actually did very poorly in the low 50% when they were four are still doing better than the high 50% for those in the high risk um, environment. So you can see how that, so those who were in the high risk environment just declined over time. And the ones that were in the low risk environment declined a little bit, but they stayed much more above those at the bottom. Another way to think about this is if you took a test at eighth grade. And so you take this test at eighth grade, and again, the high income students who stood at the bottom of the test are more likely to go in and go to college than the highest scoring people in the low income group. And so again, even if you can see that there is a gradation. So obviously, if you do better on the test, you're more likely to go to college. But income is a much better predictor than even your ability in eighth grade. And this is just another way of looking at it. Um, if, you, it, it it's, if you look at relative mobility, um, it's really sticky at the ends. So 42% of parents who are born to those in the bottom fifth of the income distribution remain in the bottom fifth, and 39 born to parents at the top remain at the top. So if you're born in the top 1% or the bottom 1%, you're much more likely to stay there. And in the middle, there's a little more up and down, but um, it just shows that it's very hard to um, overcome social and economic advantage in this country, at least. So this is a model that myself and a colleague came up with, looking at what aspects of social and economic advantage actually influences children. And so there's financial security, which I spend a lot of time thinking about. There's things that are going on in the family, so at the, at the household level. Things are going on at the neighborhood level. And then, of course, school systems. And so this is the basic model. And you'll see how I've done it over time, because I tried to put it in a toxic stress framework. Um, but if you look at financials, um, you have education, income, and assets. And usually people look at one or the other, but they usually come together. In the US, they're highly influenced by race. 
and family configuration, so a two-parent household versus a single-parent household. Um, and so the amount of finances you have kind of influences what happens at the household level, particularly the level of stress that families feel and the level of material hardship that they feel. Um, parental involvement and parental behavior aren't as directly linked to financial, but these two are a direct link. And then the kind of economics you have influence the kind of neighborhood you live in and the kind of resources that are available to the child in the neighborhood. And all of these help fluids the level of stress that the child feels at the individual level, and that influences health, social emotional development, and cognitive development. So this is the general model. In low stress, low toxic stress households, um, they usually have higher income assets and education, so they don't have much material hardship. There are neighborhoods that are positive and are helping. Um, and if there is any stress that the child feels, because maybe their, their parents are, um, have mental illness, have other things, they usually have protective relationships. This, oops, sorry. This blue is protective relationships, so someone at school or another family member who kind of helps them deal with those stresses. Um, so this is kind of an intolerable stress household where, it's, where, where sometimes bad things happen, sometimes there might be something happening in their family or in their neighborhood or in their school, but they have a lot of supports to help them get through it, including the resources the family has and the economic side. But in contrast, Toxic stress households are typically lower income, lower education, lower assets. That means they have much more material hardship, much higher levels of parental stress. Their neighborhoods aren't as strong, so there might be environmental toxins, broken systems, schools that aren't working very well. And so all of that stress that's put on the child isn't mediated by positive relationships, and so they tend to have poor health and social emotional development and cognitive development outcomes. And so, of course, if you're thinking about what you can do to help children um, who can find in this, if you work at the f at that child level, you might do something like um, having some sort of intervention um, to help the child deal with stress, right? So you have some sort of um, ACE intervention or 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 trauma-informed care at the individual child level. Um, if you're working with the families, um, you might try to help them get a better job or do more in the workforce or deal with the mental health or substance abuse issues. So you might try to do things at the household level. Um, if you work at the community level, you can try to do community organizing. You can try to have after school programs. You can try to do things that will help the child in that way. And obviously, if you want to go back to their level of financial security, you might think about some of the things I do around helping families build wealth, helping families increase their income, helping families do better at the economic. But um, all of these things together, if they're all going in a negative direction, really are difficult for the child. But if you can start to intervene at the, with the child, with the family, with their economics, or with the neighborhood, you might be able to provide at least some of those protective relationships that might help children through this. So this is kind of the model that myself and Christine Robinson came up with, just trying to explain why is it so important that financial resources and community resources are available. And if you don't, if you have this toxic stress, what are the likely outcomes for children? So with that in mind, I, I have some strategies for wealth correction. Um, first, I'm thinking about it at a kind of larger structural level. And then I'll talk about some of the child savings account models that I've been working with myself. So basic principles. Um, sometimes when people see the data on the racial wealth gap, they say, oh, well, they're spending their money on tennis shoes, and they're not being very financially prudent. They're not making wise decisions. That's why there's all these differences between, let's say, whites and blacks or whites and Latinos. And individual prudence can be helpful um, on the margins. But if you are a good budgeter with very low income, it's not going to be the same as if you have more resources to deal with, and you're a bad budgeter, right? Um, so, so even if you do have financial capability classes and budgeting classes and count your pennies and cut your coupons, it's still not enough to overcome intergenerational disadvantage and structural inequities. Um, so progressive policies and innovative programs can try to make a dent in this. Um, but rather than focusing on survival and consumption, so giving you food to eat for the month, or, or giving you clothes to wear for when you need it, um, but also thinking about overall economic development and capacity building. And so that's what I think about when I think about building wealth, um, helping families go from the point where they um, need to um, get assistance, but where they actually have their own resources that they, that they can grow and make decisions for themselves. So just a quick quote from the Roberts Foundation. Um, you can't escape the fact that you don't service people out of poverty. At its core, the ability to exit poverty is a question of employment, asset accumulation, and wealth creation. And if, this, if I was given a talk just on this, I'd give you the whole scheme, how you go from having a job to maybe um, starting to save, um, maybe starting a business. And but we're not doing that now. But just thinking about just services are going to help people get out of poverty. You need to find some ways to help people actually build wealth. So there's a lot of different ways you can think about this. You can think about what 
can we do to help low-income families build wealth, middle-income families build wealth, um, help upper-income families to sustain and build their wealth? You can think about different ways that the infrastructure can help do that, whether it's faith-based institutions, civic organizations, um, sororities, fraternities, neighborhood associations. There's a lot of different levels. And so this is the model that myself and another colleague, Stephanie, came up with. Um, so if you're looking at low-income households, at the individual level, things like investing EITC refunds. So if you get $2,000 in, in April, so that's coming up now. I'm sure many people have already gotten their refunds. Rather than spending it all, finding some way to in, influence them to, to save at least a portion of it, to have um, money in the bank if they have emergencies. Um, having home ownership programs for first-time home buyers. The individual development account, which I'll show you a little bit about more in a second. All those are helping low-income households at the individual household level. But you can also have things at the community level, so things like investment clubs, things like housing co-ops, things like um, risk pools for insurance, because at least in Detroit, I'm not sure about Cleveland, but if you live in a low-income um, zip code in Detroit, your insurance is much higher as well, even though, even though you really can't afford it. Um, so having risk pools through, through churches or through um, community-based organizations is a way to help. If you're looking at middle-income middle households, um, some of you probably maybe have these yourselves, but having retirement plans, employer-based retirement programs, maybe buying and selling real estate, uh, maybe having college five to nine plans for your children. And at the, um, at the larger level, community level, maybe microenterprise co-ops, CDCs, LLCs. And these are more kind of more middle income household strategies. And if you happen to be high income, things like trust funds, estate planning, family endowments, and then you may want to create a foundation or have some venture capital partnership. But the thing is, no matter where you are, even if you're high income, um, you still need strategies to help build wealth and help your family. But obviously, if it's a low income um, end of the income distribution, they, they, you need a lot more support in helping build wealth. So that, those are just kind of, if you're interested in this, those are a lot of ideas around kind of thinking about ways to incentivize wealth creation and to build wealth at the household and community level. If you don't know what individual development accounts are, this was something that was coined by Michael Sheraton, and it's the idea that individuals who are at the low end of, of, end of the income distribution really need help to build wealth. And so if you have an individual development account, whatever money you save is matched with incentive dollars. Sometimes it's three to one, sometimes it's five to one, some places as much as eight to one. But if it was a two to one match, you'd put in $10, the incentives would be $20, you'd have $30 in your individual development account. Usually, these were for people who were below twice the poverty line, but they had to be for asset building uses. So to buy a home, to get an education, or to start a small business, some places allowed you to put it into a retirement account. But this is an idea that was was for a while really thriving at the, at the household level, but I always thought, why wait till someone is making twice the poverty line or below? Why can't you start with their children to help, help them have those opportunities to have mobility sooner? Um, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about child development accounts, which are also known as child savings accounts, as an intervention approach. Um, and so these are special, dedicated accounts that for, typically, ideally, would be for lifelong developmental purposes. The way they've existed in the US has mostly been for college, um, but you can easily see having little tweaks to make it for home ownership or business ownership, just like IDAs. Um, but it's, it includes features to help, particularly low-income families, to um, save and to accumulate assets. The original vision, you open early, ideally at birth, um, if not in preschool, like Head Start programs. Um, they should be universal, so they should be everybody, and progressive, so those who are at the low end of the income distribution gets more incentives, more matches, more support. <laughs> Um, and so the basic proposition is that context matters for how children imagine what's possible for them for the future. If no one in their community is working very much or has gone to college, it's hard for them to imagine that for themselves. But if you have a savings account dedicated, let's say, for college for children, um, it helps them experience that what seems like a very long-term future thing is close, something that they can do, something they can handle, something that they can act now to prepare for that future. Um, Daphna Orsiman has spent a lot of time talking about identity-based motivation, and so this is kind of her piece, that if you can get the, the, the future to fear near, if you can get people to think that people like you are doing this too, it's much more likely that you're going to make a little effort to, let's say, do well in school or be engaged in school or to plan for college. So these accounts are a way to kind of bring a practical um, intervention to kind of bring those, that thinking to children and families early. But the goal is to set up a savings account and all the relevant activities around, if, if, if need be, if it doesn't exist in the school and neighborhood, to help young 
low-income children see themselves as college-bound um, and that they actually need to save and engage in school because they have a positive future waiting for them. So that's a basic proposition. Some research that was done by Willie Elliott shows that even small amounts can make a difference because, for example, in the seed demonstration that I've been a part of, on average, there's about $1,400 these accounts in the first four years. And some people say, $1,400? That's nothing. You can't even buy a credit, you know, <laughs> maybe for, or at least not much of a credit um, for that amount of money. But what Willie Elliott showed from his research is that even as little as $500, particularly for low-income families, make a big difference. So um, here, for High school students with no college account, 7% of them graduated from college, and 45% of them even enrolled. In contrast, high school, high school students who had college savings were 33% likely to graduate and 72% likely to enroll. So they're three times more likely to enroll and four times more likely to graduate, even with as little as $500 in an account that's in the child's name. So it might not be enough to pay for college, but it's enough to get them on the road to be successful in college. And so where do these exist in the United States? So um, as part of the seed demonstration, Saving for Education, Entrepreneurship, and Down Payment, which was a huge demonstration that was foundation funded that went from 2004 to 2008. Um, it was community based. This one in Oklahoma started in t a little later. And it was statewide representative of young people in Oklahoma. And they were given $1,000 in the Oklahoma College Savings Plan. And because this is a true experiment, and those kids are still like sixth or seventh grade now, they're still being followed over time. But it exists in Oklahoma. In San Francisco, there's something called kindergarten and college. There, the treasurer of San Francisco helped um, launch this. They were the first municipal child savings account program. Um, in Maine, this was a foundation-funded program. At first, they offered it to people when they signed up. But just think about this. Someone just had a baby. Someone comes with a piece of paper. You sign up for this account, and not, 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 not many people signed up. So now they're making it automatic. And so now every child who's born in Maine through the Harold Alphonse Challenge gets a college savings account. And the money they were using to recruit people, now they use money to send books and learning materials to young people. And so um, what's going on in Maine is a pretty good example. In the state of Nevada, there's a college kickstart program. They're doing it through their um, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, in Lansing, I can't help create um, Lansing Save. And they're starting with kindergartners in, um, in, in the Lansing School District. Um, and it's been around for a few years. Um, but they're doing um, a lot more in the schools for programming around kids. So once a month, someone comes in and collects savings for the kids. If the kids have two dimes, they'll deposit it for them because they want everyone to participate and not so much about the amount of money. Um, in Promise, Indiana, it's a rural program in Wabash County in Indiana. And there's many others that have been emerging over the last few years. So even though we don't have a federal program for child savings accounts, at the state, local, and county level, there's a lot of promising practices. Um, and I'll say, say this one really quickly. Um, even though I've been mostly engaged with interventions around child development accounts, in Detroit, I've been really involved with summer youth employment. Um, one, because it's one's first job actually helps influence your attitude to work and plans for the future. Um, the new WIOA Act that was passed to replace WIA, the Workforce Investment Act, and now the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, actually provides resources for the state and local level to offer employment and training to young people. So there are federal dollars to do these programmings. And of course, what I'm interested in, it's a platform you can build money, management skills, and financial capability when people are young. So it may not be a full-fledged child savings account program, but you can work with the young people when they're working in the summer, um, help them take, um, open bank accounts, help them set savings goals, and if there's funding, even match those savings when they do. Mm -hmm. So I think summer youth employment programs are a nice platform to build some of these ideas, even if there isn't a full-flung child development account program at the local level. So I'll take a little bit of time talking about some of the projects I've been working on. Um, my seed, which is, again, the Saving Education, Entrepreneurship, and Down Payment demonstration, but it's the one in Michigan. It was a quasi-experimental study. We offered Head Start families in the Pontiac, Michigan area, um, these Michigan 529 college education plans. They were seeded with $800. If they're below a certain income, they got a $200 match from the state. So almost all of them started with $1,000. We matched whatever the family saved, one to one, up to $1,200. Um, and there was programming when the children were a head start um, around thinking about planning for the future, financial capability, um, helping parents get the resources they needed. Um, but those children who are in 
Head Start in 2004 and 2005 are going to be graduating in 2019 to 2020. And so um, myself and, and my team actually did follow up on these Head Start kids who got these accounts. Um, and what we did, we, we interviewed the parents, but we also interviewed the children. And the one thing I can say concretely for now, because we're getting data from the state to actually see who graduates from high school and goes into college, but when the parent and the child talked about these accounts together, the parent and the children had much more concrete plans for, for education. So we talked to one ninth grader. She said, I'm going to use my money to go to a community college for two years, and then I'm going to get a scholarship. I'm going to go to a four-year college because I want to save money. I want this money to go far. They've been thinking about that. Even and you know, they're low income. They don't have a lot of money in these accounts, but they're thinking strategically about how they're going to use it. And so that's just one snap of what we're finding. But like I said, once we get data from the state, we'll actually be able to track who graduates from high school, who goes on to college, and who graduates from college. And hopefully, we can start to demonstrate in a real quasi-experimental design um, some of the things that Willie Elliott found from secondary data analysis. That's what I've been doing with my seed. Um, in Michigan and Southwest Detroit, there's a program called Alternatives for Girls. They do a lot of programming for women and girls. Um, they take prostitutes off the street. They do after school programming. They um, have a program for parenting moms. Um, but in 2015, they launched an asset building program. And I, I helped them do that. And so um, they started out with 35 middle school girls. They're adding more, so they're probably getting close to 50, 60 now. Um, and they opened a Michigan Education Savings Plan 529 accounts in the girl's name. And 81% of the families have contributed to the accounts. This is really good. Um, even in my seed, probably only about 40% of families saved. But because they have a personal relationship with the kids, personal relationship with the parents, they kind of encourage them to at least save $5 a month. 81% of the girls have been contributing, and the families are engaged. And so we'll see if these middle school girls continue to stay in the program and go on and graduate from high school and go on to college. As I mentioned, I've been helping with the Detroit Summer Youth Employment Program. Um, I helped lead the Data and Evaluation Subcommittee. Um, we've done exit surveys, um, and the mayor has been a major champion, and the numbers have been growing from 3,000 to 5,000 to 8,000, hopefully eventually 11,000. Um, but what's nice is individual work sites have been experimenting with these child savings account models. So one program that um, did uh, what's called America Saves through the Consumer Federation of America. They said, if you come in the Summer Youth Employment Program, we're going to automatically enroll in your account. We're going to give you a direct deposit. And then if you meet your savings goal, we'll match your goals. And so compared to the rest of the city, um, which about 50% of young people had savings accounts, 95% of these kids had savings accounts. When uh, um, compared to the rest of the city, um, when about 30% of them thought that they could actually save, <laughs> um, when you talk to this group, it was, it was much more. So it just shows that if you can have that through a whole summer youth employment program, that'd be better, even though we have to get some funding to do the matches. But it just shows that even within a limited time frame, a six week program, you can have differences if you start to bring these sort of things in. I mentioned Lansing Save already. Um, they've launched 2014, 2015. Now all kindergarten children, they're doing a lot of things in the classroom. What sort of things can you do in the classroom to engage parents and children around these accounts? Um, and I've been doing some capacity building work and economic development in Detroit. Um, I was part of Skillman's Good Neighborhoods Initiative. So for 10 years, we worked with six neighborhoods intensively. We helped them create governance councils. We helped them do bylaws. We helped them do grant writing. We helped them create youth councils. Um, and now we're doing capacity building and training in those six communities and, and really the whole city. Um, so I think I will stop there and see if you have any questions or comments from me. Wonderful. Let's have a hand. <laughs> I'm sure, uh, like you, for me, I want to just lock Trina down in a room. There's so many points of connection that we could ask you more about that could help work that we're doing right now. So let's hear from others. Who has questions? I can do the, yeah, I don't mind. Taking the Who has a question? Great. And if you don't mind introducing yourself, that'd be wonderful. Sure. My name is Tracy, and I am an um, MSAS alum, and I work for Columbus City Schools. And so my question is about Lansing and where they're getting the funding to provide those accounts for the children. Great question. Unlike some of the programs that were foundation funded, they didn't have $1,000 to put in. They actually just started with $5, and they work with a local credit union. But they actually are getting matching funds from a federal 
organization that does fundraising for them. Um, and so the numbers aren't as big there because they're starting much smaller, but it's the whole school system and they're engaging teachers and they're working with families to do that monthly deposit thing. And so the initial deposit wasn't as good, but the engagement in the classroom has been much better. So the, that $5 per account actually came from the credit union and the match came from a federal organization because the school district didn't have any money to, to put in. Yeah, yeah. Um, my name is Kevin Cronin. I'm a guardian. Ad I'm a Tishorni guardian ad litem in juvenile court. So a, a lot of these figures are painful to hear, but also painful to live with, mm -hmm. with uh, working with families. Um, the one thing that strikes me, though, is also there's sometimes there's a limited role for government and a bigger role for all the private sector. And I wonder if you view that as true. And how do you kind of rally, how do you rally all the private sector to do some of the things that you need to do? Because so much of this is really about getting training and jobs for people. Well, I'll go back a step. Um, the reason that Detroit Summer Youth Employment Program has grown so much is that the mayor has pressured the private sector to contribute. <laughs> so um, um, probably about a third of the dollars come from the federal government, and the rest has been raised from the private sector. So they're both providing jobs and providing money for others to provide jobs. And so that's an example where the private sector has been engaged, at least in summer youth employment in Detroit. Um, Another idea that's been happening around child savings accounts is that some places are creating debit cards. And so if you even whatever you typically buy or typically spend in the regular marketplace, a proportion of that, and those agreements are made with grocery stores and with other private funders to say, we'll take 1% of what would be our profit, and we'll put it back in these child savings accounts that are being created. So that's another potential role for the private sector. Um, but I think the other thing to think about, particularly at the adult side, is how can you have employers engage, particularly at that low end of the income distribution? Because people who have pretty good jobs with good benefits aren't as worried as people who are in places where they don't have that. And so how can you get employers to offer better retirement practices and to, to engage with their community and their families. So I don't think there's easy answers, but I think if you engage with corporations over time, there are possibilities, but you have to kind of make it win-win, so something the corporations are willing to do, as well as things that the communities want. And so those, that's what I've tried to do. I'm not saying it's an easy answer, but that's what I've tried to do. <laughs> Let's hand it back. Kayla Geschke, I work at Niebert Connections, um, the local community building nonprofit. Um, two questions. One, how many students are in your SEEDS program? Mm -hmm. And are they all in the same school? And how much funding did it take? And then I was also wondering about the involvement of banks and if any like community reinvestment dollars have been like pointed towards this or how they've been as partners in any of the projects you talked about. OK. So the, the larger seed demonstration had several thousand young people. The program I worked particularly with in Michigan had 790 in the study. Um, they were offered 500 accounts. So there's 500 Head Start families starting in 2004, 2005 who were given accounts. They were each given $800 from philanthropic sources, but they also had a match at the state level. Um, so that's where those monies came from. And then some money also went to pay staff who worked at the Head Start centers who um, did outreach to the families and did this programming. Um, um, but without the philanthropic dollars, it would have been a lot harder to put that big amount. But even in San Francisco, they're starting with $50 that comes from the city treasurers. Um, in St. Louis, um, actually, because of what happened in Ferguson, um, the treasurer in St. Louis is actually using money from meters, parking meters, to put in these accounts. So there's a lot of possibilities, um, but the money from my program came from, from foundations. Um, and your other second question? Oh, banks. Um, banks are usually partners in this, but they don't usually do a good job of running them. Um, oftentimes, they offer no fee accounts for these kind of things, which is to them a loss. Um, sometimes they do use some community reinvestment dollars, but they prefer to do things like financial education and, and home ownership type stuff. They don't like to like seed money. Um, so they're partners, but they do what they're good at. They're not always good at running or, or doing the initial deposits all the time. Yeah. Is that why you're Hi, uh, credit uh, union thing for Okay, well, I'll answer this quick. The re we actually started out working with banks in Lansing, but the more we talk with them and the more they realize what they had to do, um, and I think um, their national partners kind of sit step back and say, we're not going to do this anymore. So rather than stopping the program completely, we stopped working with the bank and we started working with the Michigan State Credit Union. 
Earl Johnson uh, State Board of Education. In the uh, programs that were statewide, like uh, Seed Oklahoma, and I think you mentioned some others, did the state legislatures play any role in, in moving this policy forward? Okay, that's a, that's a good question, so I'll, I'll go back a step. So there are several states that have passed um, things. So Connecticut has passed it at the state legislature level. Um, Maine, it was, a, it was a foundation. So they have state support, but it wasn't a state mandate. Um, in Nevada, it was through the Health and Human Services Program, but it was a local. It wasn't necessarily at the state level. Um, there are some East Coast um, states that, have, that are doing a regional model and do have state buy-in. So I think it depends. Um, I, I think there's been cities and states that have passed and supported these things, but um, it's not across the board. There's a few states, a few cities, and a few counties, right now at least. Hi, Mark. <clears throat> Mark Chapman, on the faculty here, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, your first slides were very uh, discouraging, as we know, and so I wanted to ask you, from your vantage point, uh, either on a policy or practice level, where do you find most hope in terms of looking at the next 10 years? Hope. <sighs> um, probably at, at the local level, I find more hope because people actually know the families and children we're working with. And so when we have something that works, they get excited, they see the results, and they continue to invest, like some youth employment in Detroit. Um, if you really want to reduce economic inequality, you have to make changes like in tax policy. You have to do things that are going to be really, really hard at the federal level. Huh? We just did that. <laughs> Except we went the opposite way, right? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so at the federal level, I don't have a lot of hope um, right now um, in terms of reversing these things. But I think at the local level, there's a lot of good energy. Um, there's a lot of community involvement. Um, there's a lot of practice models, so no, not every community does everything well, but they find a few things that they care about, and they try to do that well, and you want to at least encourage that until we may have a federal government that actually is doing more investment in cities and, and low-income families. Sorry I couldn't give a more hopeful answer, though. <laughs> there's a hand here. And <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Dorcas Johnson. I come to you today from Weatherhead as a dual fellow in youth development and resiliency theory. We are those protective relationships that you spoke about. Yeah. In any of the projects, are they matching families and or the youth with someone like us so that if they don't have someone that's in that capacity that they can access it or a list of places where they could find someone like us locally that could help them? That's a great idea. I mean, the policies that happen at the state level probably don't have those relationships. I mean, the programs I know that did that pretty well were the ones that were with foster care youth. So for example, um, in San Francisco and in Denver, Colorado, they actually worked with foster care youth, and they did partner them, not one-on-one, -on -one, but with um, adult mentors and with local programming. But they realized that foster care kids had really specific needs. Um, and, and in Head Start, they because it was part of a community action agency, they had a lot of services within the agency that the families and children can do. But I mean, it's a great idea. So for children that don't have resources, they have these accounts, but they need more supports along the way. Can you be intentional about doing that? I think that that decision has to be at the local level, but I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, but Alternatives for Girls is one of those organizations that is doing it for their girls, but not citywide. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Jerry Maloney from MSS. Yeah. I'm wondering, have you looked at how parents buying into the child development accounts, how that affects family wealth in general? That's a good question. I don't think we've studied it per se, but we have done interviews with parents, and they've said that because this account has kind of motivated me to think about differently, what we do is we have conversations. So this is how much money we have each month. Um, what can we maybe give up a little bit to put in these accounts? Or some families sold puppies. I mean, they did all sorts of very innovative things because they were thinking, in this case, around the accounts about their children's future. But sometimes it helped them kind of get a better handle on some of their finances to also save for other things. Um, one thing that came up when we talked to parents is, you know, I want to save these accounts, but I'm, I, I don't want to save for my retirement. I'm trying to buy a home. I'm trying to do these other things. And so sometimes thinking about this early for their child also helped them get some of the strategies or talk to people who can help them think about some other wealth building strategies. I want to jump in okay. uh, and call on your micro side okay. for a moment. And 
just get your, what are you learning about what's going on in terms of mental maps and mindsets for people in experiencing this? And how much is that one of the ingredients of the change you're seeing? Because you made the, had the quote, you can't service people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And you talked about part of the rationale for that is you need a job, you need to be saving, you need, but I think another part of the rationale is how people think about themselves mm. and a kind of l dependency versus agency and an effect over your life. So I'm wondering, to what extent, could you talk a little bit about what you're learning on the mental side? Well, this is more from the IDA side. I did, I did interviews with people who had the individual development accounts as adults. And one of the things they talk about is, I think about myself differently because I was successfully able to save and put a down payment on a house, let's say. Um, I used to be one of those people who people looked down on and didn't think they could do anything, but now you know, I have a bank account. People look at me with respect now. Even if it's just in their mind, it may, they may be looked at exactly the same, but they see themselves as having accomplished something and, and making plans for themselves and their families. And if they have success in that, um, it makes a big difference. So even though we're um, theoretically talking about what happens with children, um, we've seen it in surveys and in research that it definitely happens with adults. They see themselves differently. They see themselves as participating in the system. Just to, just to give one small thing, um, regardless of what you thought about welfare or welfare reform, once we started doing income tax returns and people started to file and get their money back with the EITC, even though I don't think they should go to H&R Block, they go to H&R Block like everybody else, and they're filing their tax like everybody else. They think they deserve that money, as opposed to getting a handout. And even though that may be a completely ridiculous way of thinking about it, people feel like I'm doing what everybody else is doing. I'm working and earning my way. I'm planning for myself. I'm saving and building assets. I'm just like any other American, and not some you know, truly disadvantaged, at the bottom of the ladder sort of family. I'm kind of doing things for myself, and it's not quite you know, asking people to pull themselves out by the bootstraps because there is resources, there are incentives, there are supports, there are transfers, if you will, but people see themselves as participating in it as opposed to being given something. And so I think that helps. Trina, um, at the state and local level, mm -hmm. uh, where you mentioned one municipality was using money from parking meters to help out with accounts, mm -hmm. is there any traction on that, you know, where they collect fines for drug offenses or whatever, where they can use that as matching funds for these accounts for young people? Do you, do you, do you mind introducing yourself as far from Oh, so I am Martel Teasley, uh, Dean of the University of Utah College of Social Work, and glad to be here with you all. Well, one thing I think is important that's happening with these accounts is once they get started and families and school districts or cities or whatever level are getting excited about it, they start thinking about what can we do to raise money? What can we do to invest in these things? So like I said, in St. Louis, they decided to be parking meters, but in but different cities are doing different things. Um, so I think it kind of raises people's imagination. So it's kind of like, you know what? These are our kids now. I mean, you know, we've, we've made investment for whatever reason in these kids, and so we don't want to just give up on it. So what else can we do? And so what can we add in tutoring if we need tutoring? What can we add in, you know, um, college, um, what's it called, counseling, so that you can do that? How can we link to your, our, our college access networks? And so things like those conversations are happening. It's not always more and more money, yeah. but it's more and more collaborations and, 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 and connecting to other things that exist in the state in the city. I'm uh, Dale Anglin with the Cleveland Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, I came from a place that tried to do this somewhat unsuccessfully. Okay, tell and me I, about that, please. <laughs> they tr a, a donor tried to do it in a town in New Jersey, mm -hmm. in a town that doesn't trust government. Uh -huh. And so when they tried to do it as an opt-in, or an opt-out, people were like, we don't want this, you're, tr you're, you're, you know, you're on my civil rights or whatever, even though they were trying to help. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting just how people see the work. But my question is, this seems like a natural thing to do in a lot of places if you can figure out the financing different per locale. What's the conversation that has to happen particularly with some of the government officials to get them to get over this hump and say, wow, we could try to figure this out? Because some people, there's so many things they're dealing with, yeah. right? What, what's the conversation that has to happen to get them to, to think about this? And and be, or be an advocate in some way, right? Be a support. Well, there's usually two arms to the to discussion about this. So one is helping build financial capability um, in households and families. And two is the, these, these quotes about three times more likely to enroll in college and five times more likely to complete college. So it's seen, it's seen as a kind of a, um, a, a mobility and a, and a college access sort of approach. Um, the other thing that happens sometimes when it's successful um, is that people say, we don't want to give things to these families, these parents, because they make bad choices for whatever reason. But they kind of say, well, we 
see ourselves investing in these children. And so that's kind of the way it usually happens, that we decide as a city, as a state, that we want to invest in our children. Oftentimes, they've had some bad news, either test scores going down or, um, or for example, with these 529 college savings accounts, it was supposed to be a way for, through the tax code for everybody to save for college. But the only people who are saving for college are those who are in the top 10%. Very, 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 very few, if any, like 1% or 2% low-income families are saving. So if nothing else, you're changing that dynamic. And, and for example, all, all our Head Start families are low-income, and 40% and of them were saving. And all of them had a 529 college savings account. Same thing in Oklahoma. Every child who is in the program, at least, has a has a the Oklahoma 529 College Savings Plan, that did not happen before. So it's a way of equalizing assets, if you will, but also with the idea that it's going to lead to better educational outcomes. That's usually how you people talk about it. Do you want to follow up that? No, I'm good. I had a design question for you. Okay. You talked about these three pillars, early, universal, and progressive. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about the universal one, because the, <laughs> the, the downside is you're giving money to folks who don't necessarily need it as much as others. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how you feel about that particular element. Is that just a political move, or is that a way to get people all in who wouldn't get in themselves? What? Well, it's usually a way to get people all in, because if you're using birth records or school records, you have the whole universe, right? You have every child that's born or every child that's enrolled in school. Um, but the, the reason that that's not so bad is it's progressive. So, so in Lansing, the, start, the council started with $5. So the wealthy people put their own money in, <laughs> but the low-income families would, have to, would get the incentives and the matches and the progressive, pr progressivity so they can have their little bit of savings grow more. Um, so I don't mind universal if the initial deposit isn't very much, but you have ways to really target low-income and vulnerable families. That's the way I would think about it. Um, now, if you gave everybody $50,000, I'd say something differently. But if it's you know, five, $50, rather than debating about who's in and who's out, everybody's in. You could do programming in schools. You can give materials at hospitals. You can send things through the mail. You know, it's, it's universal and easy. But then the progressivity comes that you give the people who don't have resources either matches or you know, if they have 95% of attendance, they get you know, extra money put in their accounts, but wealthier and higher income families don't. That's how I think about it. I think universal, you want everybody in the system. The way the IRS commissioner, who's been part of some of these conversations, said you get the plumbing in, so everybody has an account, everybody plays, but then the resources go differentially. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm uh, Bree Zeltner. I'm a reporter with The Plain Dealer. Um, so uh, along those lines of, of making it universal, you mentioned that in, in one of the studies, only 40% of the, the uh, was it students ended up participating or well, saving? Saving, okay. their own money. Yeah. Um, so how do, you, how do you improve that percentage? Right? Or you know, in, the, in the other study where there was, it was 80%, um, what's, what's influencing whether or not the, the students or the families are actually saving? I'm going to answer your question two ways. First, this is a huge issue we had with funders at first. Like, we're giving all this money, we're starting these accounts, and only 20, 30 percent of families are saving. But they're low-income families, and at least initially the kids were preschool. You know, college was a long time away, and paying rent and lights and things like that sometimes seemed more pressing. And so when you talk to them, even though they hadn't saved anything, they still saw that account as their kid's future. And they still talked to their kids about their account. They saw it as their account. They owned the account, even if they weren't saving. So I don't think saving is necessarily, particularly if you're really on the margins, should be an indicator of success. But many people talk about it, so um, I, I don't disagree with you. But I would also say what they're doing in Alternatives for Girls in Detroit is they have a community-based program. They see the girls every day at an after-school program. And they just say, just put $5 a month. If you lose your job or have some sort of incident you can't, um, we won't hold you to that. But we really want this expectation that everybody's going to do a little bit if they can. Now, you know $5 a month over 12 months is $60. It's not a lot of money. So it's not going to really be that different than those who gave zero. But it's this kind of like, can you do a little bit? The other way that other countries do it, I can give the example of Singapore in a second, is that you get some sort of automatic deduction, oh, let's say, off your income. And so it automatically goes through. So there's, it, it's a regular deposit as opposed to people having to make the effort to save. And so if you really want universal participation or more, it needs to be something like that. So some little bit goes all the time over time, because then you can take advantage of compound interest, as opposed to being disappointed in very, very low-income families or if they can't scrape you know, 
something to put in for themselves. But even for those very low-income families, they weren't doing it when the kid was in preschool. But now that their kids are getting closer to college, they're, they're actually becoming more engaged because it seems more real to the parents at that point. But I don't think it's a, it's a failure, if particularly low-income families aren't saving a lot of their own money. If they have initial deposit, and they're engaging on the account, and their kid is um, more engaged in school, I think that's a success, even if they aren't saving necessarily their own money, at least consistently over a long period of time. But I know that wasn't quite what you were asking. But like I said, adult tournaments for girls, they have a relationship with the family, and they're making them commit to a small amount each month, and that's working for them. Young men, I'm a uh, research faculty here. Uh, it's very interesting um, idea, and but it looks like the success of the program is really based on that uh, integrity of the family. So, so what if are the family? integrity of the family. Mm -hmm. So, if the child is just preschool, but to go to college, to like there is like 15, 16 years, and your family doesn't stay as a Whole and you know, and also these low-income families, they tend to have a lot of disruption. So, do you have some idea about how those family dynamic may work, you know, affect, and also there's a way of to prevent or reduce the impact of that uh, family disruption? That's a good question. So. Just last year at an APAM conference, I looked at the housing aspect of these, these families that I followed up with. And some families had a lot of residential stability. They'd moved five times in the, in the last five years um, when they lost a job or they moved in and out of their parents' house. And so there was a lot of disruption. What's nice is the account still is in the child's name. And, if, and, and wherever they move to, as long as they update their address, and sometimes even if they don't, those account statements are still coming. So it's still kind of on people's minds and presence. So I don't think you can necessarily prevent all disruptions, maybe some, but not all of them. But I think that what's nice, and, and I think even what some of the research shows, that these accounts are on these kids' minds early and across their childhood, let's say. And so even if there are disruptions in, in their family life, hopefully there's still teachers who are engaging with them. Um, there's college counseling that's going on in these accounts. So it may be at least a, a small piece of stability, even if a lot of other things are going on around. Because um, in the households, I mean, we started in 2004, 2005, and I followed up and interviewed them in 2014, 2015, 2016. They'd been married and divorced and remarried. They'd been in and out of houses. They bought a home, lost a home, moved in their parents. I mean, there was a lot of change, but they still had the account that we could at least talk to them about. Um, again, does that, that, does that make up for some of the disruption? Maybe not, but at least it provides an anchor for the child. And maybe if their parents can't be the stable part, maybe someone else can help them think about college and their future and their life, and they can have those conversations earlier. But I wouldn't say these accounts prevent those disruptions. I just think that they may provide a support in spite of those disruptions. Hi, Holly Martins, um, alumni. Um, at what point, I'm assuming the child owns the account once the child becomes 18, right, or is emancipated or whatever, and then um, what control does a parent have before 18, and what happens if they leave the city? Leaving the city doesn't matter. Or the county or whatever. The count's still in the name, um, regardless of where they move to, but this is an interesting thing. So. In Oklahoma, where there's an experiment and they have a whole infrastructure around it, they actually have two accounts. They have the account that the parent saves in and is matched, and they have the money that comes to the state they can't touch. In Michigan, the $200 match that came from the state, they can't touch it. They could have taken out any money they put in, and even some of the initial deposit, even though very few did, even in a recession, it was amazing. These very low-income families did not touch that money because it was for their college, kids' college education. But you can set it up, and there's another way to do it. So it can be in the child's name as a beneficiary, but the local community foundation or the state actually owns the account. And so if that's the case, you have to go through whatever steps you have to go through. Um, but even if it wasn't that, um, for the, the nice thing about college savings accounts is there's built-in penalties and there's a built-in structure that it has to be for college. But because there has been fears about this, it's usually in the state's name or in the nonprofit's name um, in terms of um, that directs the account, but the child is the beneficiary. You know, about four years ago, and I, I don't remember totally the details of this, but the Cuyahoga County started a college savings account, and I believe it was for uh, children that were born 
uh, I think it was $125 the county put in. And over, and that's about all they did. I mean, you know, they opened the accounts, they, they did some publicity about it, but I don't think they did much work with the families themselves. And it was universal, it was not progressive in the sense you're talking about. And uh, they stopped it three years after they started it because when they looked at the results, people were not saving and, and actually weren't opening them. So they didn't automatically, you had to open the account in order to get the money deposited. What advice do you have for government, either at the county level or the state level, that if you're going to do this, what are the things you have to have in place to really incentivize people to use it, help them use it. Um, in the local, in the more localized, I can see you can provide supports in a, a different kind of way, but what advice would you give to a, a government agency, a government that w was um, trying to do this? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Helen Williams from the Cleveland Foundation. Sorry. And an alum. I would say, that you need to have some sort of partner on the ground, whether it's a school system, or Head Start, or Health and Human Services, or you need something to kind of be, not so much hands-on kind of programming, but to kind of be your supporter on the ground. So like I said, in Lansing, even though there's a lot of, not a lot of money, the school system behind it, and all the kindergarten teachers are really excited about it and doing things in the classroom. Like pizza parties if everybody saves, and that sort of thing. Um, and just to give an example, for SEED, when we first, first, first started, and we had preschoolers, um, when we first started out in the Pontiac area, we had to really struggle to get people signed up for these accounts. In contrast, another partner was Harlem Children's Zone. Their accounts were signed up in like a week. <laughs> it was done because they had relationships with those families. And so um, if you don't have an infrastructure around the account, you need to work through something. So schools or trusted partners or something, because if not, it takes a long time for everybody to get it. So along the lines of that line, um, what would be the role of the, um, the sort of the collective level, the, the modeling of, of faith-based organizations or neighborhood resident associations or civic organizations or sororities and fraternities, would they also serve that purpose of helping to incentivize um, or to change the mindset in terms of savings? Sharon, please introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Sharon Milligan. I'm the associate dean here at the Mandel School. Um, well, two things. For that model we had was kind of a community level wealth building. And so where can you start is where that was. But I still think it's a good point. So for example, if Churches can be made to think, you know, all the young people in my congregation are getting these accounts. What can we do to support the children and families so that we're engaged and excited about this? If you have a community-based organization that has programming, all these kids, particularly with Universal, we all have accounts. What can we do to engage with them about that, to understand, go on college tours, to help with homework so they are engaged about this? So if you're an organization that works and interacts with children, um, ideally, you can also be engaged in supporting the families to think about these accounts, maybe even saving the accounts, but at least engaging around education and planning for the future. Um, um, and like I said, what happens oftentimes is the families that Without any intervention, the families that are advantaged get it. And they start saving, and they start preparing, and they run with it. But you need a little, sometimes, assistance for families who don't have bank accounts, who don't understand the stock market, who don't know investment choices. They need a little bit of support. To give an example, when we were um, enrolling in these Head Start stations, we had these kind of orientation sessions. One session, we had someone who was from the neighborhood who said, you know, no matter what, sign up. <laughs> it's good for you. It's good for your kids. You know, you ought to do it. This is what it means. I'll help you understand the details. Another time, you had someone come in who was still from TIA CREF, but talked about the risks and how difficult it is and how things go up and down the stock market. And that is maybe people signed up. <laughs> and, so just show, and it's a small thing, but it means someone who engages with them and said, this is important. I'll help you through it. Don't worry about you know, the nuances at this point. Just sign up and, and let's get engaged in this. And so I think that kind of makes a difference. So that's where the local partner comes in, kind of explaining things, making it seem like this is really for you. This isn't some weird government thing that's taking you know, try to control your life, but it's just an opportunity, and so why don't you take advantage of it? And that's what local partners, I think, can help do. Uh, Jerry Mahoney. 
I'm, I'm just wondering, as, as parents start to participate in this account, in these child development accounts, does that kind of change their attitudes about their children's education and the reality of going to college? Or do you, have you looked at attitudes of parents? I'll say this two different ways. All the parents, except for maybe a very, very small, and most of them we probably couldn't find because they were very disruptive. Um, but they want better for their children, right? They want them to go to college. They, they're saying all these things about them, but they don't know how. They don't know the steps. Some of, so sometimes we would ask, particularly the control group, would you want your child to go to college? Yes, we to college. How do you get it? Well, maybe they'll get a scholarship. Maybe. Or hopefully something will happen, but I don't know how it really works. So what's happening is the accounts provide you an avenue to actually talk about what does it really mean? What kind of grades do you need to get in school to be able to be eligible for college? When do you need to take the SAT? What type of college do you want to go to and why? And so it, so it, it helps put the money in, but it also provides a vehicle to have those kind of conversations. And obviously, for parents who've gone to college, who've done some of that before, it's an easier conversation. But because the parents who haven't gone to college and who are excited about this account, they ask questions because they really want better for their kids. And they know that if they don't go to college, they're going to be like me. They're going to be in this dead-end job that doesn't go anywhere. I want to get all the information and support I can so my kid can do better. And so I, I think all parents want it, and they say they want to go to college, but they don't have any really realistic idea of what it takes to get there. And this account kind of helps bridge that conversation, I think. Okay. Let me ask a question. Mm -hmm. The families, like we said, that may not have contributed every month, was there a capacity where maybe they could um, use their debit card and then send it in to the account or go to an employer and say, I would like this pre-tax deducted, something like that? Those are very good questions. Um, one problem with 529 accounts, particularly in Michigan, is you can't just go to a bank and make a deposit. You have to send it to the state in a, in a, in a check or a money order, and it has to be in a pretty large amount, I think in increments of $25, which is why I would recommend in some of these local programs have a partner with a bank where you can start. So if you want to put 10 cents in, you want to put a dollar in, it may take you a little longer to get to the $25 you need to make the initial deposit, but at least you're engaging. Um, because the 529 plan was really made with probably middle and upper income families in mind, they, they're, they're, for people who aren't banked, for people who understand investments, for people who can't put $25 chunks at a time, it's a lot harder. Um, so that's why some of these smaller, maybe smaller local bank partners or having the money being held for the child until they can have enough to go um, would be helpful. Um, so that would be ideal. Um, the other thing that happens, though, um, and I'm going this from the IDA model, the adult side, not the, the child side, is you almost always had regular participation when you have direct deposit. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to go, make, go to the bank and make deposit. It just automatically comes out. That's why many of us who have a retirement plan for our jobs, we don't think about it. We don't write a check. We don't make a decision. 3% or 5%, whatever it goes every month. So this is kind of Michael Sheraton's idea is you need to um, institutionalize things. So you don't have to think about it. It doesn't have to be people who are really good budgeters or not. I mean, the plans that are being talked about that's happened in the US is just rather than fighting about what kind of retirement plan we have, everybody who works, 3% goes to retirement. <laughs> and then before you even get your first check, you don't even miss it. And if it's automatic like that, everybody plays and everybody's engaged. And you have to find sources of that for child accounts, too. So whether it's from parents' checks or maybe from tax revenue or, or tickets or whatever it is, but you can find a way. Of course, if you save, you have more. But everybody gets a little bit at a time every month. That's what other countries do. Um, Canada has some plans for that for low-income families. Singapore has a, a a program that starts when you're young and then goes through college and then goes to retirement. Um, so, but most of those programs that are institutionalized, where it's automatic, a little bit every month, all the time, of course, if you save more, that's great, but you're not penalized because everybody's kind of in the system. Because a lot of these are at the school level or haven't been voted on by the legislature, or kind of, it's hard to kind of make it that formal. That'd probably be something to be a federal government thing. But ideally, you're not talking about who signs up and who saves, you're talking about everybody gets a little bit every month because everybody's planning for the college eventually and then a retirement eventually. That would be, I think, institutionally what would be best, but obviously we're not there yet. <laughs> Congress said that folks have to get on with their Friday afternoon, so what I want to do is invite, some of you may still have questions. Dr. Shanks will be here for a few moments, so please do come up and talk with her. This is just such a great example of what can happen uh, at a university setting when you've got a mixed audience, 
one of the national experts on a topic and folks who really have an eagerness to hear and share questions. What a great conversation. So can we give Dr. Shanks a hand? Thank you.